Alright, the squad, it's the Hawk here, and I'm extremely excited to introduce today's video. It's one which is likely to have mixed opinions in the comments section because it involves the Hulkster and Eric Bischoff. And we just know how much everybody loved them in TNA. And it's a huge faction that went on for ages, and all the biggest stars in the wrestling company were involved. I'm of course talking about Hulk Hogan's Immortal Faction. Before we start, make sure you lariat that like button and smack subscribe, it makes the Hawk come alive. Also, Wild Slapnuts t-shirts are for sale, the link's in the description. Now let's get on with today's video. The main thing I always remember with this faction is that people instantly pan this whole thing as just Hogan and Bischoff trying to recreate the NWO. So we'll find out if that's true or if this faction held any unique qualities. Who were the main members? What was the point in the faction? And did anyone benefit from the faction? Today we're going to find out, because this is the story of the Hulk Hogan Immortal faction in TNA. A little bit of time has gone by since TNA lost to the WWE in the Monday Night Wars of 2010. Hogan and Bischoff are seemingly neutral management figures who are trying to do what's right for TNA. Bischoff also has Miss Tessmacher as his assistant. Despite their fairly good behaviour, the icon Sting hasn't been happy about their appearance in TNA and he's been on the warpath. He's beating up everybody and he's speaking in riddles. He's paranoid. Basically, to the casual viewer, Sting feels like a complete dick at this point. Why is he acting this way? Eventually, Kevin Nash starts acting in a similar way to Sting, again talking in riddles. They are also joined by the Pope. They have all found something out through sleeping with Eric Bischoff's assistant, Miss Tessmarker. Meanwhile, TNA has this giant monster character called Abyss who's been aligned with Hogan as a good guy, even though it's intolerable. And Hogan's been trying to make Abyss into a main eventer by having him as a mini Hogan clone. But it seems, even he has enough of being a Hogan lover and he turns heel. He proclaimed that nobody's going to want to be in TNA of what's about to happen. That night, Abyss cements his heel turn by brutally taking out Mr. Anderson. But more importantly, choke slamming Jeff Hardy off the stage for a table. Keep note of that second attack. Abyssomania was no longer running wild. The next week, Abyss explained this attack to Hogan as they told him to attack. They will arrive in TNA soon, and nobody can stop they. Abyss even attacked Hogan and tried to force feed him his Hall of Fame ring. Abyss upped the ante by choke slamming Mr. Anderson off the stage. Everyone was scared of the monster at this point, and they are coming. It was actually the most interesting Abyss had been for years. This was the monster he had been in the earlier days. A lot of people think I hate him. He can be good, but he was put in so many stupid storylines over the years that this period is nice. They were heavily teasing a match between Abyss and Hogan at this point, and indeed, there was supposed to be a match, but Hogan was not in shape with all his back problems at the time. Abyss is just an absolute menace at this point. The focus of his attention and hatred shifts from Hogan to Dixie Carter. Rob Van Dam is the heavyweight champion at the time, but Abyss mauls him backstage and this looks like a murder scene. Rob is hurt so badly that the title is vacated. Abyss started referring to the date 101010 in all of his promos, which is of course the day of the Bound for Glory pay-per-view. At Bound for Glory, they will take over TNA and remove Dixie Carter from the company and exterminate Hulk Hogan. As we get closer to Bound for Glory, Pope, Nash and Sting are still complaining and talking in riddles, but it was now clear that they had hatred for Bischoff and Hogan, although why was still unclear. On the show before the next big pay-per-view, Abyss kidnaps TNA owner Dixie Carter and drags her out to the ring, but he's talked down by Eric Bischoff. As a punishment, Dixie Carter demands that Bischoff fires Abyss. A contract is drawn up to fire Abyss after Bound for Glory, and like a complete dumbass, Dixie Carter signs the paper without even reading it. She is in such a rage. So we arrive at the Bound for Glory pay-per-view. Finally! It's been four months at this point. Who expected this storyline to have such a long build? At the pay-per-view, Rob Van Dam beat Abyss in his return bout, but that isn't the bigger story. The Pope, Nash and Sting face Joe, and a wild oh, slap up appears. Double J, Jeff Jarrett. These two guys have been standing up for Hogan and Bischoff, but during the match, Jarrett bails on Samoa Joe and leaves him to get killed three on one. Isn't Slapnuts just charming? In the main event between Angle, Jeff Hardy, and Mr. Anderson for the world title, there's a ref bump. Eric Bischoff makes his way out of a steel chair and he's soon joined by Hogan. They are like they're going to attack Hardy with a crutch, but then Hardy smashes Angle with the crutch. Hardy has turned heel and he's now the world heavyweight champion with Bischoff and Hogan by his side. They're joined in the ring by Slapnuts and Abyss. They're here. I have to immediately question how any of that makes sense. Abyss had been killing Hardy for months. He choke slammed the man off a damn stage and tried to kill him. He's been trying to kill Hogan too. No matter how much you try and suspend your disbelief, I'm not believing that. Dixie Carter's attorney accuses Eric Bischoff of changing the contract for firing Abyss. Bischoff responds saying that they have millions of witnesses who saw her sign it on TV and it stands. I don't think that's quite how it works. 
Hogan and Bischoff have taken TNA from Dixie Carter. How any of this is even slightly legal is beyond this hawk. Hogan's reason for turning on her is that Dixie made him false promises about his power in TNA. Bischoff said it made all the sense in the world. No, it didn't. Jeff Jarrett being part of this faction doesn't make any sense either, because Bischoff had been bullying him and forcing him to be a janitor earlier in the year. Slapnuts did it because he hates Dixie Carter for taking the company that he founded. And Abyss did it for The Rock. No, he just did everything that Hogan told him to because he loves him. Completely out of the blue, Ric Flair's Fortune faction, which is AJ Styles, Kazarian, Beer Muddy, Matt Morgan and Douglas Williams, reveal that they're also on Hogan's side. Someone is loudly screaming, ha ha, suckers, we tricked you all, suckers. As if it made sense, we should have seen it coming. Fortune joined Hogan because they were annoyed with Dixie Carter for bringing in washed up ECW guys. Flair says that he's gonna love Hogan every day more than his five ex-wives and they can all kiss his ass. They're of course headed up by Heel Jeff Hardy. Look, I've made an entire video on that run so he won't be the focus of this video, but I will say I quite enjoyed Heel Hardy and it's unfortunate what this led to for him. They bid in the old TNA heavyweight title and give Jeff Hardy his own immortal title, and I always wondered what AJ Styles thought watching that scene. The group is named Immortal. Kevin Nash and Sting are offered a place in the group, which they reject as they say they have changed and they are now friends with the young TNA guys and they're going to back them. Then Nash leaves TNA and Sting disappears for a bit too. Classic. Why couldn't they have just said what was going on in the first place? None of this would have happened. It's technically their fault. They could have prevented it all. On the management front, Dixie is still complaining. Hogan looks her in the eye on TV and tells her that he screwed her and stole her company. At this point, how can anyone possibly suspend their disbelief and believe that the law would be on Hogan's side here? Security team Gunnar and Murphy are pointless characters, but they join Hogan's side and take Dixie Carter away. Dixie Carter's husband Sarge is smacked out for some reason. What kind of a name is that anyway? Bischoff fires Miss Testmarker for sleeping with wrestlers and revealing his secrets. He forces her to shake her ass and be a wrestler as a punishment. And from here, it's pretty much dominance over TNA for Immortal. It's not exactly surprising seeing as more than half the TNA roster are part of this group. About three quarters of the standard TNA episode was now dedicated to Immortal shenanigans and lengthy promos would become commonplace. Immortal would initially feud with Mr. Anderson. It was quite a long feud actually. Anderson suffered a concussion which TNA decided to turn into a storyline. They had a real chance of making this serious issue into something to help create awareness and make a change to wrestling. Instead, Bischoff took great joy in making Mr. Anderson have matches with what he described as a little boo-boo, and saying that Anderson is just paid to be hurt. Seemingly, the only person on the entire roster who had a problem with all of that was Matt Morgan. Although he was initially part of Immortal, he had a massive problem with making Anderson wrestle hurt. This would lead to Matt Morgan leaving Immortal and siding with Anderson after only two weeks. Seems kind of early to have members leaving factions. Anderson would take time off from this concussion, which left Matt Morgan as pretty much the only person posing a threat to Immortal for the next few months. You would expect RVD to be a threat to Immortal, as he was leading the other faction at the time, EV 2.0, the ECW guys. It was Tommy Dreamer, Raven, Rhino, Richards and Sabu, and they hated Bischoff for trying to put ECW out of business. The problem was that Rob Van Dam got completely distracted from fighting the main enemy and was concerned with who in the ECW faction was going to betray him. So Rob wasn't main eventing, and over the next few months, Immortal and Fortune slowly eliminated ECW guys from TNA until the faction just quietly faded away. Also, after Rhino got fired, he was paid off and was briefly an enforcer for Immortal. This didn't lead anywhere for the war machine, and Van Dam beat him on pay-per-view, and as a punishment for the loss, Bischoff refused to give Rhino a new contract. Slapnuts would restart his feud with Kurt Angle and wouldn't actually have too much involvement in Immortal in the beginning because he'd have his hands full with Kurt Angle. Often Jarrett's matches involved jabs at mixed martial arts. He would however have backup from Gunnar and Murphy, the worst security team ever. The scrub security team would also turn out to be wrestlers. Jeff Jarrett beat Samoa Joe in a few matches back to back through cheating, which I'm sure would bring a few people's piss pots to boiling point. Abyss joining Immortal would turn out to be a massive negative for his career as his crazy out of control 10 10 10 message gimmick that was actually reigniting his career peaked at that point. He was no longer the main guy and he was just used as a heavy for Immortal. Matt Morgan kind of took up the spot that Abyss had been occupying as Morgan briefly became a main event of going against Immortal, something that no one really wanted to see happen. Matt Morgan challenged twice for Hardy's belt on pay-per-view and both times he failed. The only thing this led to was a new member of Immortal, a referee because every NWO ripoff needs to have a bent referee on their side. But this was no Nick Patrick, it was far worse. This was Garrett Bischoff, the son of Eric Bischoff. It was played off at first like he was just making mistakes and not deliberately screwing people on behalf of Immortal. At the time he was going by the name Jackson James and it wouldn't be revealed that he was Eric's son for a year. 
The Pope swore to protect TNA because Nash and Sting couldn't be bothered to. This turned out to be a bad decision as Bischoff paid off the Pope's brothers to give him a good beating. Abyss eventually dealt with him and beat him in a casket match. Pope went off to do some other irrelevant stuff. A couple of months in and the biggest problem with this faction has revealed itself. The face of the company is Eric Bischoff. It's not even Hogan. Hogan would be spending quite a lot of time off TV at this point for more surgeries. And these Bischoff segments got completely out of control. He would appear in about 10 different segments per episode, and it felt like his hair got greyer and greasier as the week went by. And these constant promos would have severe consequences for the TNA show. On almost a weekly basis, the show ran too long and would end in the middle of a match. They did have an overrun for a separate program called Reaction, but Reaction didn't even air in the UK. So if you were like me, you were constantly missing the ending to main events. Hell, sometimes the main event hadn't even started as the show went off the air. This was the most amateur of wrestling promotions. Where Perk Salt the Hawk didn't know about. I don't remember this happening. Perk Angle gonna. Wait, what? No! <laughs> and because this is TNA, they didn't even do recaps of what happened in the main event on the next show. So you never knew. Yeah, this time in TNA is a complete car crash. Douglas Williams was the next man to leave Immortal. Ultimately, like Morgan, he didn't agree with Bischoff and Flair wanting to give people concussions either. Although they were a part of Immortal, Fortune was still kind of kept as a separate faction. So I'm not going to talk about what they were up to too much, but I will say that they were entertaining doing things like icing Ric Flair. But this is an Immortal video, and the fun segments weren't happening with Immortal. No hate to Fortune, they had some good moments. Dixie Carter returned to say that judges are looking into the situation. Why that took two months, I have no earthly idea with such clear evidence. This meant Hogan wasn't allowed to be on TNA TV for whatever reason. Probably more operations, he was gone for ages. This started a new nonsensical storyline that Bischoff demanded Immortal hold all the belts, because the belts meant power and leverage. This was never explained any further than that. With Anderson now back in TNA, Morgan stepped aside, but they still continued talking about all the concussion stuff. Mick Foley returned and joined the concussion crew. He doesn't want people being like him. Anderson doesn't see that bothered about his own concussion and keeps getting annoyed when anyone talks about it. The Immortal Faction continues to get worse as they hire Welsh Roider Rob Terry as their new enforcer. Anyway, back to the belts because the Roider sure won't be winning anything meaningful in his career. Bischoff demanded that Immortal take the belts at Genesis and that's what happened. First, Kaz took the X Division belt from Jay Lethal. Beer Money took the tag team titles from the Motor City Machine Guns and finally Abyss took the TV title from Douglas Williams. But it was not all roses because Mr. Anderson took the world title away from Jeff Hardy, concussion and all. Anderson used this title win to take shots at the WWE and Triple H. Following Genesis, two new members joined Immortal. The first would be cold-blooded Matt Hardy, who was basically just normal Matt Hardy with dreadlocks, a gut and a submission for a finisher. This led straight away to the first ever Hardy Boys TNA tag match, which you would have thought would be a big deal, but it wasn't and TNA just put them in a throwaway match the same night that Matt debuted. The other person to join Immortal was Slapnut's wife, Karen Jarrett. So many easy people to hate in this faction. At this point, TNA planned to have the return of the main event Mafia to feud with Immortal. It was going to be all out faction warfare and to hell with everyone else. But TNA had to change plans because Kevin Nash and Booker T decided to go back to the WWE. This was hyped up by having the newly debuted Crimson killing Abyss in dramatic fashion and saying February the 3rd, they're coming. This attack kept Abyss off TV for a few months and destroyed any momentum that he had left. 15 on 1 gang beatings were common for Immortal, and this is how Scott Steiner re-debuted with the company, running 15 men off. Well if anyone's capable of doing that, you have to imagine that Steiner is. But TNA had backed themselves into a corner at this point and they needed to do something. They had promised a reveal, so what would it be? Well what they did was have Fortune turn on Immortal and cost Jeff Hardy a title match. With Fortune leaving Immortal, it was now 90% morons. This turn did lead to a cool moment though. Jarrett is making fun of the four Immortal guys until Robert Roode grabs the mic and proceeds to cut an amazing promo. He explains that Fortune are tired of all the has-beens joining TNA and overlooking the guys who built the company. Again, you have to suspend your disbelief here because this had already been happening for years and yet Fortune chose to join Immortal in the first place. But this promo would help to suddenly flag up Roode as someone who could be more than a tag wrestler. Ric Flair, however, would not join the rest of Fortune as he'd screw Styles and stay of Immortal. A shame because Flair was always a fun part of Fortune. Hernandez appears in TNA after a long absence. He seems to be joining Immortal, but then he just quickly disappears and eventually does a feud with Matt Boring. At the next pay-per-view against all odds, Jeff Hardy does beat Mr. Anderson to take his belt back. A completely pointless title reign for Mr. Anderson where he achieved nothing. 
This started a sulking gimmick for Mr. Anderson, who was constantly complaining and asking for title matches. He got very annoying and dislikable. Bischoff would be the main target for his hate, because as established, Bischoff is the main character on the TNA show. A new thorn in the side of Immortal would be a faceless, nameless entity known as the Network. This was a massive cop-out. Whenever anything needed to be explained, it was explained as the Network forcing it to happen. On the business front, Hogan returned to TNA after three months and announced that he's been to court against Dixie Carter, and it's now safe to say that he controls 100% of the company. That is a rough break for Dixie. That jury must have been Hawkamaniacs. Jeff Hardy has been placed in a title match against a mystery opponent. Why is it a mystery? Because of the network. And the mystery man turns out to be the returning Steve Borden. Jeff and Sting have a five minute main event match. And yes, Jeff is able to wrestle this one. Don't worry, the one you're thinking of is coming really soon. Sting gives him a scary looking scorpion death drop from the ropes. And now Sting is the champion. So Jeff doesn't even make it a month as champion, even worse than Anderson. Then we get to the Victory Road 2011 incident. A drugged up Jeff Hardy loses to Sting again in 90 seconds because he's so drugged up that he's not capable of wrestling a match. At this point, you might as well end the Immortal Faction right here, but they don't. The following impact, Immortal cuts ties with Jeff Hardy. It's played off like being an Immortal turned him into a dark evil person and it was their fault that he did what he did. They don't flat out say that he was on drugs. The majority of the people in the audience probably know what's going on anyway. His spot in the group is taken by Bully Ray, the former Bubba Ray, who's now a singles wrestler. And I have to say, he's one of the guys who would benefit the most from this storyline. In Immortal, he got the chance to cut great hilarious promos, show off his heel work and have fun matches, and he was just a good overall fit for the group. It also helped that for the next three months with Hardy gone, there was no established main eventer in Immortal. Although this meant no Immortal in the main event, not necessarily a bad thing. Not a great deal happens with Immortal for the next couple of months. Bobby Roode cuts another good promo on Hogan, and also Christopher Daniels joins Fortune. These are my biggest gripes with the Immortal faction. What was the end goal? What did they want? Where will it end? Who will end it? Why don't they even have a mortal with tired gear? Their only damn concern is finding out who's the fawn in their side at the network. It turned out to be Mick Foley. Following the reveal, Foley left TNA two weeks later, so the whole thing was completely dumb and pointless. Tommy Dreamer joins Immortal because he's apparently being forced to by Bully Ray. Nobody cares and it went nowhere. He cried a bit as he always does. Murphy is kicked out of Immortal after losing a match to the Welsh Roider. But after the match, Hogan says the match was so bad that he's done with both these guys. Another person joining Immortal was Chris Harris, the former Braden Walker. Matt Hardy had decided to bring him into the company as he wanted to take the tag titles from Beer Money. And of course, Chris Harris was formerly tag team partners with James Storm as America's Most Wanted. It didn't go well and fans hadn't forgotten his ECW highlights as Braden Walker. He was gone after only two appearances. When I interviewed Chris Harris recently, he revealed that there was supposed to be a storyline where he caused friction between Beer Money with Storm eventually reforming America's Most Wanted with him and leaving Rude. This would also help Rude become a singles wrestler. That would have made sense. But as this is TNA, nothing that happens ever makes sense. Now there's something pointless about Eric Bischoff hating Vanilla Midgets in the X Division, so he forces Abyss to take them all out and become the X Division champion. It really sucked. Other highlights in Bischoff's war against the X Division was beating the Young Bucks, Matt and Nick Jackson in a match. Yes, Bischoff holds a clean win over the Young Bucks. TNA debuted the tagline, Wrestling Matters. Then they proceeded to have a 15 minute Hogan and Bischoff promo to open the show. Angle and Slapnuts have been feuding this entire time. The matches were actually really good and there was lots of entertaining segments between them both. Whether or not you agree with the ethical side of bringing in their real life problems into a storyline is down to you, but it did create some damn compelling TV. This feud finally comes to a head at Slammiversary 2011 in a match where the winner gets a shot at the world title. It's another excellent match which Angle wins. Also on this show, Mr. Anderson finally gets his world title shot after months of moaning and complaining and becoming a heel. And he wins it for the second time. Something that the leader of the Grey Correct Bischoff is very happy about because of course, Mr. Anderson ends up joining Immortal. I guess they needed a main eventer. They didn't really like Mr. Anderson, it was more done out of convenience. But once again, you have to suspend your old disbelief because Mr. Anderson would never have sided with them. He hated Bischoff for screwing him out of the title for so long. Sting starts turning into the Joker and he's going after Hogan and he's desperate for a match with him. Whether you like Joker Sting or not, that's your choice, but I love some of the things he did to Hogan. Slap Nuts and his wife are banished to Mexico by Kurt Angle, but they return a month later and Jeff is now the AAA champion. Don't you just love it when TNA didn't stick to a stipulation? It makes the fans feel really dumb. Whilst he was gone, Scott Steiner replaced him in Immortal. I guess he hadn't been doing much since the main event Mafia storyline failed. I'm surprised it took him that long. While Steiner didn't actually achieve anything with Immortal, he did have some excellent chemistry in promos with Bully Ray. These two together was truly a work of art. 
27 days later, Mr. Anderson dropped the heavyweight title to Sting. What was this, the year of terrible title reigns? They've all been appalling, at least it's consistent. He had help from Fortune who were in clown costumes and they took out immortal members throughout the night. Along with that, Sting was named the new network representative. So it begs the question, why are immortals still around if Sting has the belt, therefore he has the power, and the say of what happens in TNA as the network representative? It doesn't make sense. As Kurt Angle was the number one contender from the match he won ages ago, and he's now dealt with slap nuts, sort of, he won the feud all right, that counts. Anyway, he challenges Sting for the heavyweight title. At least there's two popular guys fighting for the belt who obviously care about TNA. At Hardcore Justice, the title match happened. At this point, it's just completely unnecessary. But yeah, towards the end of the match, there's a ref bump. Hogan makes his way out of a chair. Angle takes the chair away, but still smacks Sting with it. Angle wins the heavyweight championship. Hogan looks really annoyed about this win. That doesn't make any sense either, as he was clearly trying to help Angle win. Isn't he happy that he just got his wish? Then on the following TNA episode, Angle joins Immortal because, well, you better get your old disbelief in suspenders again, and you better tie them up tight because you're going to need to for this one. Angle revealed that Dixie Carter was aware of the affair going on between Slapnuts and Karen the whole time, but she never told Kurt. But Hogan knew that Dixie knew and told Kurt she'd known the whole time. <sighs> Anderson is kicked out of Immortal. They never liked him anyway. Matt Hardy was quietly fired from TNA for driving with a DUI. Goodbye, cold-blooded Matt Hardy. You brought nothing to the show, and it was clearly not a good time in his life either, judging by how he looked. In the meantime, his brother Jeff returns to TNA, and he's shunned by everyone for his actions. Time for some more incredibly hard-to-believe stuff. Sting winds Hogan up so much that Hogan agrees to fight him at Bound for Glory, and he'll also put up his ownership of the company on the line. He just kind of blurts this out, and then Hogan immediately regrets what he said, like his word is some sort of legally binding contract. Bischoff has been bullying Abyss for his incompetencies for months and leaves him in tears on several occasions. The idiot has appeared. This eventually leads to Abyss leaving Immortal. It's a shame that Abyss was so awesome on the lead up to Immortal and so terrible and idiotic whilst in the actual faction. Sting wins the Bound for Glory match against Hogan and the company goes back to Dixie Carter. Hogan also turns face after the match and he takes out his former Immortal employees. So surely that brings the faction to an end. No. What? Why not? The faction's literally named after one of Hogan's monikers. There's only a few people left in it, and they've lost full control of TNA. They have no reason to be here anymore. End it. Kurt Angle loses the world title to James Storm on the next Impact, so none of them are even champions. That leads to Robert Reed finally becoming the main eventer that had showed promise for the last couple of years. Bischoff, Flair, Steiner, Bully Ray, Gunner, Slapnuts and his wife hung around like a bad stench in TNA for a couple of months. They mostly feuded with Eric Bischoff's son, Garrett Bischoff. They tried to recruit people to join Immortal, but everybody hated them. After a couple of months, Sting fired Slapnuts and his wife from TNA. He went off to do Rinka King, the TNA Indian wrestling promotion. From here, the Immortal name just sort of gradually fades out. Bischoff remains affiliated with Gunner as he uses him to punish his son. Bully Ray would be affiliated too, but he was starting his own push towards the main event. Scott Steiner was released and also went off to India. If you really need an official end date to this immortal faction, it would be Lockdown 2012. There was a cage match pitting Team Garrett Bischoff versus Team Eric Bischoff. And once again, I'll ask you all to suspend your disbelief that the scrub Garrett Bischoff could lead a team of Mr. Anderson, Austin Aries, AJ Styles and RVD. Like he has any right to tell them what to do. The stipulation is that the losing Bischoff will have to leave TNA for good. Ultimately a pretty good stipulation. It was a win-win. Bully Ray and Gunner were on Eric Bischoff's team, the last turd crumbs of Immortal. But ultimately the match is won by the son, Garrett Bischoff, and a guitar. So Garrett Bischoff ended Immortal. Was this the dramatic ending you were hoping for after 18 months? Garrett Bischoff, give me a break. You'd think someone much more important than Garrett would benefit from ending the faction. At least Eric Bischoff's goodbye is funny. He has a going away party attended by Hills and former Immortal members but it ends badly for him when Garrett locks his dad in a toilet and knocks it over. A fitting way to end a turd-covered faction. So 18 months, well it was more like 22 months because Abyss was talking about them for ages before they actually came. The group itself had constant member changes, inconsistent champions, a lack of cohesion, the story had massive plot holes, they had no branding or catchphrases to at least make them popular, and Eric Bischoff got more TV time than was possible. So much TV time that it caused the TNA show to run over time on a weekly basis. Look, it's really easy to hate on this group, but let's try and find the positives. Bobby Roode. He became a main eventer off the back of this group. His promos against Hogan definitely made him look like a star. 
Bully Ray benefited too. He got more mic time than ever before, and at times he was almost the leader of the group. He wouldn't actually become a champion until the next faction warfare started, six months later, but he proved he could do it. And Hill Hardy was at least a unique attempt that could have worked. Would this have worked out more interesting if the main event Mafia had gone ahead? Probably, because fighting against Mr. Anderson and Matt Boring for six months just didn't do it for me. So Immortal goes into the turd zone, because the leader of the Grey Crew makes me groan. But not sexually, it's like when I take your girl home. 